Please be seated. Education is not the learning of facts. It is rather the training of the mind to think. A very good afternoon to one and all present here. I, Melissa of 3rd BCom Accounting and Finance, welcome you all for the second session of the conference with the guest lecture on the topic, Current Warehousing Trends in Business Environment. On behalf of the Department of Commerce, it gives me great honor to welcome our chief guest of this session, Mr. A. Matthews, National Warehousing Logistics Manager, Axo Noble India. Please give a round of applause. Now, I call upon Ms. Aksa Mary Benjamin of 3rd BCom A to give the welcome address. Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to all of you to the second session of the conference 2023 organized by the Commerce Department SFS. First of all, I thank God Almighty for giving us this opportunity to come together for this event. Today, we gather here, not just as students and faculty, but as a community united by a passion for commerce and a shared commitment to excellence. I would like to introduce our esteemed chief guest for this occasion, Mr. Matthews A. Mr. Matthews A. is a distinguished figure in the world of commerce and academia. An astute professional with over 35 years of rich experience in supply chain logistics and warehousing, internal audit, corporate finance, cost accounting, treasury, variance analysis, risk-based auditing, and risk assessment, etc with significant responsibilities and achievements like managing logistics, warehousing, and contributing to cost savings is no small feat. His role involves a broad range of responsibilities from planning and execution to training and risk management. This brings a wealth of knowledge and experience to our conference today. We are truly honored to have Mr. Matthews A with us as his presence adds immense value to the conference. We eagerly look forward for your insights and wisdom, which will undoubtedly inspire and motivate all of us. We welcome, sir. A warm welcome is extended to all the distinguished delegates. Your presence here enriches our conference absolutely. We are also honored to have with us a respected head of department, Dr. Nirmala Mohan, whose leadership and guidance have been instrumental in making this conference possible. I would also like to acknowledge the hard work and dedication of our organizing committee, staffs, and volunteers who have worked tirelessly to ensure the success of this event. A warm welcome to them as well. Last but not the least, I welcome all the students gathered here, without whom this conference is incomplete. As we embark on this exciting journey together, let's embrace the spirit of camaraderie, learning, and achievement. Once again, I extend a heartfelt welcome to each and every one of you. Let's make this conference memorable and enriching experience for all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aksa. Now, I call upon Ms. Varsha of 2nd MCOM to give the memento and the fruit basket to our chief guest. Thank you, Arsha. We are indeed fortunate to have a profound personality with us. Now, without further ado, I invite our chief guest to take over the session. Over to you, sir. So good afternoon, everybody. 
hello and in hello yeah so today we are going to discuss about current warehousing trends in business environment so let it be a interactive session i welcome you all to actively discuss discuss means both of us should speak right so let's take it on a discussion mode or you can punctuate me whenever you feel like you need some more clarity clarifications more detailed discussions we shall take it forward from there okay now before we go into the uh, the theme of today's talk on current warehousing trends in business environment first let us understand what warehousing is and in the traditional sense what warehousing is in the traditional sense how we are doing the warehouse operations in in the present environment then we can discuss how we are going to do in the current environment and in the future so how many of you have gone and seen a warehouse or been into a warehouse can you raise your hands i see only one hand out there so none of you have seen the inside of a warehouse right okay so that means i need i take it on myself to make you a little more informed about how a warehouse operates in the traditional way or in the existing way what are the needs for the warehouse the types of warehouse what is the ideal warehouse okay what are the different types of warehouse all that we'll discuss now okay right so how many of you had gone with your parents or your mothers for shopping your monthly groceries many right good so what do you do you plan everything you make a list of all the items what quantity to buy right some would have finished some would not have finished but still as a precaution you would have listed it down and some quantities you have put some numbers to it and you went to a supermarket and you would have purchased it even though there was no immediate consumption requirement for it you would have bought those items and stocked it in a cupboard or in a store room if you have one right so that's basically the fundamental of a warehouse operation you store for a future necessity for a future consumption right so small businesses use godowns we call it godowns right where they'll keep their material and take from there and bring it for display onto the shops and they'll keep minimum inventory in the shops so that they don't crowd around the materials there because the space in that shop would be very precious the cost of every inch or every square feet will be very high so they will not dump all the goods into the shop or the retail area what they'll do they'll have a godown elsewhere and from there they'll take it at convenient lots now likewise but if you go ever go to go to a godown of such sort you will find it extremely un uh, in kept in a disorderly manner not orderly in fact you have to use a heuristic approach to hunt and fish out what you want right so that's how the traditionally these godowns are operating now if things are happen in a large scale in a big way where tons and tons of materials are handled and that's called a warehouse and that process is called warehousing and the person who's in charge of that is a warehouse keeper we can call him a manager or supervisor whatever it is so basically warehousing means you procure material store it in a proper way in a orderly manner sequentially first in first out with all the data of purchases kept the date of entry date of expiry and then you make it available for use in a convenient manner when you need it for, for to be consumed or sold so that is basically a, what a warehouse does warehousing activity means a set of all these activities okay now warehouse warehousing itself is an integral part of the supply chain process how many of you heard the word supply chain anybody heard the word supply chain yes supply chain okay now the 
a string of activities from procurement to the final sale is called supply chain. So what are the components? Procurement of raw materials, sub-assemblies, work in progress, production, finished goods, and finally the end sale of the product to the consumer. All these activities that form the supply chain. There are, so distribution is a key function which, which is the, which what interfaces with the customer, the end customer. So distribution's key functions are warehousing, inventory, and transportation. So that's the last leg, right? Once the goods from the production reach the warehouse, we call it, let's say, a finished goods warehouse. Let us distinguish it from the raw material warehouse or the WAP warehouse, right? So once it reaches the finished goods warehouse, the materials are transported through an intermediary. We have a business partner of a transporter who takes these goods and gives it to the consumer who has placed the order with the company. And these warehouses, if they are upstream, we call them as fulfillment centers than what is sitting in the factories. So every factory will have a warehouse to keep some stock of goods and feed them to the fulfillment centers. The right word now is fulfillment centers. They are called distribution centers or fulfillment centers because everything, every business activity is targeted towards the customer. The customer is the king. He is the very purpose of our existence. Who said this? Gandhi, our founder father. Okay. So the customer being the ultimate goal of any business, customer satisfaction, customer service level. So these are the, all the journeys of the businesses are towards this goal to get the maximum customer satisfaction and reach good customer service level and rise up to the expectations of the customer. So warehousing forms an integral part of the distribution function, which itself is an integral part of the whole supply chain process, right? Now, let's discuss what is the need for warehousing. Why should we have warehousing at all? Because warehousing, and I told you, in a large scale for businesses means warehousing. Otherwise, we used to call it go down, storeroom. Okay, now we see what is the need for warehousing. Seasonal production. Now, farmers grow sugar canes in the month of September, October. These two months, the farmers will sow the, they plant the seedlings for sugar cane, and so also in February, March. That's a seasonal product, seasonal crop. Okay, it's a cash crop. So, economics, you would have studied that. So, this product takes about 15 months to 18 months to grow and come to the, to be ready for harvesting. But the sugar factories are run throughout the year. So they need to be having consistent supply of the raw material. In this case for sugar, what is the raw material? Sugar cane. So the sugar canes are harvested by the farmers and kept near the farmers' fields in warehouses. And throughout the year, they send trucks at the required quantity or a contracted quantity to the nearby sugar cane factories. So to keep, take care of seasonal production, they build these warehouses in and around their area and store those products, preserve those products, and make it conveniently available when required by the sugarcane factories. Seasonal demand. There's another factor. Why we need? What is seasonal demand? Diwali time, you, you burst a lot of crackers, new clothes, right? And Christmas following suit, you you, have, you need to buy decorations and decorate the house. And it may be winter time. You may, you may be interested in buying some woolen clothes. But these have to be produced throughout the year so that it is available in sufficient quantities during the relevant season of Diwali, some firecracker, or in Christmas time, the decorations, right? Or new styles of wares, fashion, in, during Diwali time. Large-scale production. Now you see China. China produces in huge quantities. Any one product, a small nut or a screw, it, they produce in huge quantities. 
Why? They take advantage of the theory of mass production. Economies of scale. You would have heard about it, right? Economies of scale. The more you produce, the less your fixed cost will be. So as your production numbers go, your fixed cost per unit will start coming down. Right? But though the variable cost of the unit will be constant for every unit of production. So to take care of large scale production and to keep costs low, they produce in huge numbers. And in anticipation of the demand in the market, to feed the market, they produce in large quantities. Quick supply. Sometimes we need to keep the warehouses near the point of consumption. Near near the point of consumption, where the consumer is likely to come and buy the product. So the retail shops are all close to the, where the consumers reside or are available. Continuous production. Some pro products need to be continuously produced without any halt. Like, you know, oil production. Okay. So this crude oil availability should be readily available in huge tanks near the refineries. So continuous production also, we need huge warehouses. Price stabilization. What is price stabilization? If I do not have my product in the market at the time when a consumer wants, what happens? The price of the product shoots. You know what happened recently to our favorite tomatoes? It went up to, skyrocketed up to 200 rupees a kilo, right? And the government had to interfere, inter, intervene and provided through the ration shops, rationing at rate of 60 rupees a kilo, right? So price stabilization. So if you have proper stocks of these goods in the relevant quantities, you keep pumping it into the market, the price is stabilized. Else, it will go through the roof, it will go out of hand. It will go into a tailspin and very difficult to get it back. Now, this is the need for warehousing. Any questions up to here? Anybody like to shoot a question? You can park it with me. I can answer later also. Yes, nobody. Trust that I've been very clear so far in explaining what the needs of a, for warehousing is to be. Right. Issues affecting warehousing. Let's discuss now what are the issues affecting warehousing. Market and product-based stability is what we are going to say, talk about now. What is the market? Each product has its own market. Go to market, style is different, right? Some are, you take it from the wholesaler, some you take it from a retailer, some you take it from a manufacturer. For example, Dell computers don't believe in having warehouses anywhere. They have sub-assembly plants all over the world, and when a retailer who is a conduit, he acts like a conduit, he will place the order with Dell for a certain bunch of customers' orders, and the orders of the customers are shipped directly to the customer, right? So depending on that type of market, you need to tone down your warehouse arrangements or your uh, product availability. You, you, ultimately, it is customer service and customer satisfaction. And product-based stability also counts very important because that many products which are required should be readily available. What are the type of materials to be handled? The material types to handle means in a warehouse, it is not just one uniform, one product, just sugar, full warehouse is full of sugar. No, even if in a sugarcane factory, what will happen? You will have multiple units of packing. There could be a 25 kg bag, there could be a 1 kg bag, 2 kg bag, right? So multiple units, unit load we call it, right? Each individual packet, what it weighs. That's called a unit load. So it weighs depending upon the type of materials handled. And one factory may produce half a dozen products or one dozen products. Okay. So based on that, accordingly, the number of materials needed to produce that goods will have to be arranged for through the supply chain and be stored and preserved in the warehouse till its point of consumption happens. Now, let's discuss on warehouse facility. What is the type, the size, and location? See, various types of, depends upon the size, how much volume you are going to have, what is the throughput of your production, what is the throughput of your processes, how much materials are coming in and going out in a day, in an hour, in a week, in a month. So that's called throughput, right? Including the entry, production, 
storing and out. This is called throughput. The total quantity which travels through the system is called throughput. And the warehouse size and the type of the warehouse will depend upon the nature of the product. Suppose you're dealing with perishables like onions, tomatoes, potatoes, and then you have to have a cold storage system. You need to have it air conditioned and maintain it at a particular temperature and constantly check the materials for any spoilages and damages and wean away them from the good ones. Otherwise, one rotten apple will spoil all the others. Correct. And the location of the warehouse is also important. As I said in the first few sentences, the sugarcane growers have those warehouses close to their growing fields. Right? So, those location is very important. Otherwise, the transit time or the transportation costs to the warehouses will be high and be quite not rewarding to them at all. Next, shall we go to the next? I'm trying to punctuate myself so that you ask some questions. I don't see any. Maybe you had a good lunch and you're just reminiscing about it. Right. So inventory and inventory location decision can be influenced by company-wide strategic marketing. So my marketing style, whether I use a distributor network or a stockist or through my own uh, sales depots, wholly owned by the company or through a CNF agent. So that strategic marketing also decides what type of warehousing I should be interested in or investing in. Financial employment policies, employee policies like whether to have my, uh, my own employees to run the warehouse or have it contracted out with contract labor, contract labor working, you know, contract labor regulation abolition act of 1872. They are trying to abolish contract labor. We don't want contract labor in the companies, but still there's no political will to eradicate it completely or abolish it, but still the act is available in paper. Right? So the employment policies are to be set for whether to run by your own employees or contract labor or through third party logistics, 3PL we call, Mahindra, TBS logistics, these people are all specializing in third party logistics. Right. So financial considerations, what are financial considerations? How much money is there in my hand to invest? How big a warehouse I had to put? How much I had to shell out now? It's a capital intensive project. And how long will it take for me to get the payback out of it? When will I break even on those counts? I'll have to consider putting up a warehouse or going for a 3PL support outside the factory, not inside. So if I had to put it inside, then I have to invest, right? Little later, we'll see what are the types of arrows. We'll discuss a little bit deeper there. The ability to achieve specified degree of throughput. I told you already what a throughput is, how much a material enters the warehouse, raw material enters the system, the factory or a facility, how much goods are produced in the, system, the production manufacturing system, how much comes out and gets stored in the warehouse, how much orders come and how many, how much goods are shipped out. All these quantities, X plus Y plus Z is all is the throughput. So what is the degree of throughput I'm achieving year on year? And what is my projected forecast? So based on those statistical numbers, I need to design my size of the warehouse and the layout of the warehouse, right? And the location of the warehouse inside my plant. In a typically in a factory a manufacturing setup, you will have one warehouse concentrating on raw material inventory, which is inward material, inbound logistics. Then you will have certain storage areas near various, pro various production phases. If suppose a product has to go through four or five phases, each phase will have an Ekron inventory. There will be a transit inventory waiting to go to the next stage. So those inventories will happen along the sides of the various processes. Then at the end, you'll find the finished product after quality checking. It will be pushed into the finished goods warehouse where it will await for servicing the customer orders which have already come in or servicing a sales depot, their own depot or a CNF or a stockist or a distributor based on the orders which are informed through the information management system to the company logistics department. 
department. So the ability to achieve a specific degree of thorough port measures or tells how efficient my system is in balance. It's a line balancing, right? So there's, the production is not waiting for the raw material to come, or there is excess raw material and production is not able to use, or there is not enough space in the warehouse and production is simply producing the goods. So there has to be some sort of a balance. So the line balancing is also important. You will study this in operations research, maybe in your final year. Then, choice of unit load. Unit load is something, as I told you, what is the minimum weight of the product I'm going to handle? Is it a one kilo weight or a 25 kilo weight? What is the maximum weight? And com statutory requirements say that you cannot lift more than 50 kg, right? Factories Act says you cannot lift a load, an individual worker cannot lift a load of more than 50 kg, right? So. Unit load consideration is also important. Just because you've got a product which is 100 kilo in weight, you can't employ labor to handle it. So those considerations also have to be taken into account or factored upon. Then required service level. Customer service level. Now customers, you know how many times you go to a market or to a shop or something and say, I want this product and that product, that brand only. However, the, uh, the uh, shopkeeper tries to tell you, make you gullible to look at other products and other brands, you say no, because you are affected differently by the marketing strategies of the uh, brand being promoted by the companies. But the customer service level, you have to see what type of product is wanted and how, on what frequency. He wants it immediate or a one-day wait or a two-day wait or a one-week wait. So it depends. So what is the expected service level? The TAT turnaround time for servicing a customer order is very, very important in considering positioning your warehouse, making the warehouse available to the customer to service his order. So these are all the considerations I told you for the issues before us in considering the warehousing function. Now, how do we select a warehouse? I'm just taking you through the basics because I understood none of you visited a warehouse and nobody had asked me questions as I punctuated my talk. So I presume that you need little more information. So I'm giving you and disseminating that. I hope it falls on the right ears. Next, selection of warehouse. What is the need for a warehouse at all? Should I need a warehouse at all? Can I not have a marketing strategy like Dell? Dell doesn't have a warehouse. Dell computers, they don't warehouse. Then that they're operating successfully and they are making money. After all, business is for wealth maximization, profit maximization, not run for charity, as governments do. Now, what is the form and type of warehouse required? We again saw that in a previous discussion point. So when you're selecting a warehouse, you have to see what is the form, how big the warehouse should be. It, it should have multi-level racking or it should be horizontal. Suppose I'm, I'm a, a person specializing in steel rods, sheets, will I go for a multi-racked warehouse? I'll go for a yard management. I have to put it in a yard with cantilever support. Correct. What is a cantilever? Anybody knows? They just one post attached, one beam attached to one end and rooted to the ground and with a lot of poles sticking out where the long oversized products, rods and pipes are all laid. Okay, so depends on what type of product I'm dealing, what is the quantity I'm dealing, my nature of warehouse itself will change, right? So that is what we are discussing. So the selection of a warehouse, you have to keep in mind, now you're a warehouse manager and you're asked to, this product, I have put a warehouse. So you have to decide the factors which will influence you how to select a warehouse. What is the size and number of warehouses? Here, what we are discussing is, if a factory has one warehouse internally in the factory, does, uh, does it need to have warehouses across the places of its marketing geography? That is what is being discussed here. How many warehouses? So, 
if you are interested in having a high service level, customer service level, you will have more warehouses facing the markets, whichever the markets you are going to. So the consumer market means in all major towns you will have some warehouses which will be a fulfillment center to the customers which will so that the stocks are delivered within 24 hours max. That is the least turnaround time a customer expects. Many of you would have bought umpteen products from Amazon, right? Through the Amazon app. And if you are a Prime Video member, a Prime Video subscriber, it is given priority and in 24 hours you get your delivery. Otherwise, two days, three days, almost all the products are delivered. Right? Yes. But some which may be very far logistically orienting, orienting items like maybe Delhi, Gurgaon, Ludhiana, or Northeast, they may take seven days, six to seven days, one week, max one week. I don't think Amazon ever delivers more than six days or seven days, right? That is your experience. At least say yes for this boss. Yes, good. So, next, what is that? Warehouse layout and design. Now, warehouse layout and design again is, a, is an interlink of other items also. Like, you know, what is the unit load we saw, the size of the product, the nature of the product, the perishability or the durability of the product, all that will, in, will be factored in the layout, what is in the warehouse layout and design. So, how, which, how many zones I have to put in the warehouse, in each zone what product I had to put, I had to slot them, I had to rack them, I had to shelf them, I had to have totes, bins, drawers, whatever, AOT cranes, whatever material and equipments I do, I have. All this will have to be factored up front when you're designing the layout. For example, one and a half meters space you need for a ail movement for a forklift. Yeah, you know what a forklift is? I'll show you some pictures because you're not going to arrows, you will not know what a forklift is. I take it on that. So we will see that. Now, what are the types of warehouses for you to, you know, you just imagine you are a warehouse manager and you are asked to decide or advise the company what is the type of warehousing we should go for for our product. So unless you know the types of warehouse and what it does and what is the impact and effect of it, you will not be able to guide your management, right? So what is a private warehouse? This is wholly owned by the owner of the company. Right? It can be within the factory warehouse or it can be located outside the warehouse. One number or N number, as we discussed earlier, right? Depending upon my strategy of going to the market, how many warehouses I should put up. I may have a regional distribution center, which will be a feeder to upstream distribution centers or fulfillment centers, right? From the factory. The factory will act as a fulfillment center for the RDC or the regional distribution center. And that will act as a fulfillment center for the upstream distribution centers and warehouses which are touching base with the various markets. Right. So private warehouses, what are the problems there? What are the impacts? The cost of capital is very high here. Your money, amount of money you have to put in a capital, it will take not less than a crore to, to put up at 20,000 square feet in today's cost estimates. Okay. That is my experience. So if you put up 20,000 square feet warehouse, you will need minimum one crore capital locked away forever. And it is only going to reduce your operating costs. You hope it will reduce your operating costs if you are going to hire a lease facility. But when you are taking a private warehouse, you are ca taking a calculated call saying that I will not have third party influence. I will run with my way, my own people. There will be passion involved in it. There will be accuracy. There will not be theft. So, and I'll take better care, better uh, care for and preservation of my products. So these things are rule my mind when I decide on a private warehouse. And I have total control. I have total information management of my warehouse. Then otherwise. Whereas in a public warehouse, this is owned by public companies who put up these warehouses and other players, anybody, any company can contract space in that warehouse. They can contract space in the warehouse for a nominal rent per month and for which they're giving all services, end-to-end -end CCTV surveillance, 24 by 7 security, uh, pallets, forklift movement, loading, unloading, insurance, sub coach. Everything is taken care of there, okay? So, and those people, are fully responsible for the goods entrusted to them. 
Now the goods entrusted into a warehouse man in a public warehouse is like that of a bailey. You know what a bailey is, right? Indian Contract Act, right? Bailar, bailey, right? Who is a bailar? Anybody? Gentlemen? Anybody who is a bailar? You have not studied law of contracts yet? No. Too early in the day. Okay. So a bailer is a person who hands over the goods to the bailey. The bailey is the person who receives the goods on trust from the bailer. So temporarily the bailer dislodges his possession to somebody else. That is called bailer bailey. The bailey. The bailey receives the goods on trust from the bailer for a particular purpose of preserving, protecting, taking care. It includes transportation also. But here we are talking of warehousing, so it rests only with the question of taking the goods for warehousing, which means storing and preserving and making it available when he requires it to be given back. So till such time, the ownership remains with the bailer, only the possession is transferred to the bailey. Please understand the concept, right? So in a public warehouse, it's a bailer bailey relationship which is in, invoked. And banks love to give loans against the warehouse receipted of the goods entrusted to a bailey of such type of a public warehouse. Why? Because he cannot do anything with that product. Whereas in a private warehouse, the stocks can be manipulated, overinflated and shown, right? I myself experienced when I was an auditor, when I went to inspect a godown or a stocks in a place, they show a product here, then the time I come back, the same product goes and stands there. And I had to verify the same product twice. So that kind of cheating cannot be done in a public warehouse. So the banks trust to give loan more on the stocks held by a public warehouse than by a private warehouse. Now one more advantage is the private warehouse you have to invest the money and you have to look out for the return on the investment. And it is treated as a capital item. It becomes a fixed asset. Correct? So it has no impact on your taxation. It is complicated. You get depreciation and whatnot, all that stuff. Whereas in a public warehouse, the amount of monthly rent you pay is treated as a revenue expenditure. And it is expensed away in the year of its incurring. Right? As students of accounting, you know that Profit and loss account is prepared for a fixed 12-month period only. Starting from 1st April to 31st March of the year is called a financial year. And all the expenses incurred, activities, financial transaction happened in that year are booked into the books of accounts. And at the end of the year, 31st March, all the balances in the accounts are transferred to a new account called a P&L account. And I strike a balance between which is more or less and declare my profit, which I carry it to the balance sheet because the profit is a owner's fund. No, it's a return on the capital which the owner has put in the business. Okay, now we are digressing. Now public warehouse, so tax advantage is there when we have, when, when, the, when the revenue for it is charged off in the same year it is gone, right? So next Ideal warehouse, I told you, I already covered all this in my earlier talk. I can share this presentation later if anybody is interested. Okay, because lack of time, I have to cover my current topic. So, the, by now you know the number of warehouses, if I had to increase, what are the costs which will, in, which will impact? Inventory costs, warehousing costs, transportation costs, right? These are all simple words, English words, you know what's the meaning of it, right? Cost of lost sales, that is also very important because future profits, future earning potential is lost. That is very important. If you don't service an order, you lose that sale. Even servicing a back order, the customer service is not, customer is not happy, the customer service level is impacted. So maintenance of customer service level is very important. And servicing small quantity buyers. Today's small quantity buyers may be tomorrow's future huge buyers. So we have to keep them warm also, right? So functions of warehouse, I told you, they are receiving the goods, inspecting the goods, repacking wherever required into smaller quantities for storage purpose. And put away means putting it in a particular storage 
and picking and selection when the customer gives the order. For information, order picking accounts for nearly 60% of the warehouse activities, okay, in real life scenario. Sortation, on arrival if the goods are to be sorted out to different customers and it just passes through through cross docking. Cross docking means one vehicle to another vehicle you just attach without entering the warehouse, it is moved out to the customer. Packing and shipping and replenishing, replenishing from deep into the warehouse to outside to the shipping area. We call it order, order fulfilling area, order packing area is called replenishment. I am skipping a few things so that we will go straight to our... Ah, now, the emerging warehousing trends significantly improve operational efficiency and decision making. In addition to risk prevention and safe labor management, innovative solutions are enabling transition to sustainable processes in warehouses. As warehouse operations become more complex, these days the warehouse operations are getting very complex. Advanced robotics are used, advanced artificial intelligence is used for adapting to the ongoing changes while becoming more worker friendly. Startups, new businesses are not looking at the traditional way of doing uh, warehousing, they are looking at straight away engaging advanced robotics to reduce manual process in warehousing by integrating automated guided vehicles. You can see in foreign, abroad and all, vehicles with loads going driverless like the Tesla cars. They go driverless, they stop at signal, respect other vehicles, respect pedestrian movement, nav navigate themselves and reach the destination, hand over the cargo and come back. Or they can go between inter-plant movement, inter-factory, in intra, all they can be used for quick movement of materials. They cannot cross more than 13 kilometers per hour. That is the speed which they are allowed by law or by practice or by testing. So this avoids human error and improves the safety of both workers and the inventory which is being carried. Whereas robotics automate inventory picking, inventory picking itself is automated as I can, I'll show you some videos later, how these the robots go pick material, what they have to pick, they, they are programmed automatically, they'll pick, they'll palletize, they'll transport, they inspect also whether it is the right material or good material or packed well or not, right? And there, there are cobots, we call collaborative robots are called cobots. These cobots also go about in helping in the order picking activity. Earlier, traditionally, the warehousing is, you know, you put up a big structure, there are racks built, shelves built, and man goes to the shelf, puts it, notes it, and comes it to the warehouse management system and enters the location where that material is put. Now, the cobots, what they do, the materials are stored in rackable shelves independent shelves stacked together, taking maximum utilization of space and the bots go under them and lift up and bring the rack to the staging area. The marshalling activity is done by the robots and it will come to the staging area where the order is picked, packed and shipped. So the number of labor reduces. The people are running around in the warehouse is avoided and they are all in the front end only the interface with the transport in uh, transportation system. Warehouse management systems. These are systems which will tell you where the material is in the warehouse. So when you put the material in the warehouse, there is a, they capture the coordinates of that point, location and enter in the warehouse. And the order has to be picked, it will give that location for picking. So automatically, the man or the machine will go to that spot, pick the material and come back in the least possible time. So the TAT will be higher. The, it has improved by 3x times than a manual. Robo picking it, it, is, has contributed to 3x times faster than a manual picker. Right? That's the uh, industry results. Inventory tracking. All the inventory in the factory are tracked with various uh, technologies. For example, RFID, radio frequency identification is the in thing now and it is being widely used in almost all warehousing applications and inventory management, distribution, transportation functions across the diaspora of the business environment. Okay, so we'll see that in detail a little later. I'm running short. Okay, wearables. Now, you have seen people at a supermarket having a reader and scanning a optical code recognition method technology, some bars, fat thin, fat thin lines, and taking it. This handheld POS call, point of sale. Now, 
things have improved to another level where by wearing a smart glasses the same operation can be done that's called wearables right okay and they have exo exoskeleton suits which will help them to pick up heavy materials effortlessly okay the arms are not all all with hydraulic supported things so with the least effort only by guiding your hand you can lift the material the workers so these are all called wearable these are the in things in the current trends in the warehousing in business environment so the correct posture is maintained otherwise if you lift a product wrongly you will end up breaking your back or causing a major or irreversible injury to your spine okay so those things are all kept in mind human safety is paramount in wearables activity so wearables that the research and development in that area is very high for information internet of things how many of you have just switches you know you tell alexa switch on the fan alexa switch on the light alexa close the door open the door okay only alexa cannot bring the water bottle from the fridge right so the internet of things is just that all what mundane activities you can program it control and make it con be controlled through a servant server like your own desktop computer can act like a web server right so through that you can control all these electronic gadgets which are of some use or importance to you to play music to uh, switch off the light dim the light uh, reduce the speed, span speed increase it or switch off one area switch up the ac in one area all that stuff or direct the ac to you all stuff you can do with the internet of things likewise in the warehouse also the various in the internet of things can control various points for example the perishables are in a cold storage area and that area temperature needs to be monitored you can set up and other things to inform you to announce shatter when the temperature falls or when goes up beyond a certain degree right so yeah yeah sure no. right i am running out of time right so uh, virtual reality augmented reality also uh, is a new area where that uh, business are focusing on so Well, in, in virtual reality, they simulate conditions to for improvement. So that's how virtual reality and augmented reality means real life scenario with virtual data. They will try to improve on things. Security for warehouse. Cyber security is also a very important part plays in warehouse, so that the high value goods are not pilfered, damaged, or stolen, right? So, and data fraud is another big thing in inventory data. If it goes out. that also is about how much material you handing what is your throughput if these data is all shared it will be uh, a disadvantage to you and be advantage to your competitors okay sustainable warehousing we are trying to reduce carbon footprint and that is what our sustainable warehousing is all about and fleet management we have this lot of robots running around the warehouse and managing them servicing them repairing them is also a separate area of activity there is an automated storage and retrieval system where no man is involved only machines with using systems of levers and cages and rollers densely they can pack material so it uses the maximum utilization of the storage space barcoding i have told you explained you this is a mixture of fat lines thin lines which capture a data and we read the through a reader we take the data and do straight billing and with inventory checking everything can be done with that rfid is a radio wave identification where passive rfids by the readers throw magnetic waves electromagnetic waves and they'll collect the data and interpret and tell us what is the product available right they are better than barcode because rfids work without line of sight whereas barcodes have to act in the line of sight only you can't put from here it will not read whereas rfid anything there 10 meters away also from here i can capture the data that's a advantage so overall the substantial benefits in the current trends of by using rfid you have it eliminates manual scanning eliminate relabeling costs greater accuracy of getting the right product flexibility of data on the tag i can rewrite the tag as i go to the reader i can improve on the data which i need to put on it i can use the same tag to track the material 
I can write additional information with the reader. So overall goods can be checked in and out, put away or retrieved much faster and at a lower overall cost than that achieved by existing systems. Now let's see it quickly, quickly two, three videos which will make you understand how a warehouse operates. Okay. With that I'll come to the end. I'll show you the videos and I will exit. The first video you are going to see is inside a smart tech Amazon warehouse of Amazon. The biggest retailer. And its CEO Jeff Bezos is the world's richest man for one very good reason. His company is better than anyone else ever at giving people what they want quickly. Amazon acquired a super smart army of slave robots for one. Ingenious if occasionally unscrupulous management practices are part of the answer too. And the modern day voodoo of deep learning AI. All of which are made flesh in the most advanced stock rooms the world has ever seen. So join us today as we button up our high vis jacket and journey inside Amazon's smart warehouses. In the year to September 2020, with the global economy in the teeth of coronavirus and the bleakest employment outlook in history, Amazon reported global revenues of little under $350 billion. That's roughly double what it earned in 2017, by the way, only three short years earlier. Not bad for a company which Amazon only started Amazon has got a 2 million square feet warehouse Amazon fulfillment center in Phoenix, America. Amazon sheer unbeatable convenience for the end user. You, the customer, need a product. So you open the app or have a quiet word with Alexa. And next day, hey presto, it's sitting on your doorstep. Drone delivery is Moving also products from A to B quickly is not easy. Compared with other modern technology giants which barely need to exist in the real world, think of Netflix, Google or Facebook, Amazon needs to shift an astonishingly vast amount of sheer bulk safely, precisely and quickly, all day, every day. So how does it do it? Last year, a senior Amazon executive described Amazon's warehouses, rather poetically, as a symphony of humans and machines working together. How does this symphony actually work? Let's take it from the top. Before you've even logged onto its website, Amazon has a fairly good idea of what you're going to buy. This is all down to the semi-occult 21st century abracadabra that is deep learning AI, which Amazon has been leveraging to incredible effect since around 2015. Put simply, an algorithm makes some assumptions about you based on your age, location, socioeconomic background and purchase history. It will then, hours, days or even weeks before you actually log on, ensure that your local warehouse is stocked with appropriate quantities of stock you're likely to consider buying. This might be a certain style of racy swimsuit that the algorithm anticipates will be the hot new must-have come springtime. It might be the paperback novel for a soon-to-go viral TV adaptation. In January 2020, for instance, Amazon's algorithm correctly anticipated high incoming demands for face masks. And, well, we all know what happened there. So Amazon's smart warehouses, also known as fulfillment centers, not to be confused with their post office style sortation centers, very often know what you want even before you do. Or at least they know the very second you click buy now in the case of those wine inspired late night impulse buys. Once you've clicked, our symphony begins in earnest. You may have read headlines in recent years suggesting Amazon workers walk as many as 12 miles per shift, darting about between shelves, frantically picking up items. That's no longer quite true. Amazon's modern fulfillment centers are largely patrolled by an army of squat, Roomba-like robots this that pick up you. whole shelves, also known as pods, and bring them to a the human pinker situated as a stationary worker. workstation. Amazon's enlistment of this whirring battalion began in 2012, when the company purchased robotics company Kiva Systems, the market leader in warehouse automation, for an eye-watering $775 million cash. These bots can the carry up to 1,200 kg, from 600 to 1,200 kg they can carry. ...and capable of lifting 450 kilograms in weight, whilst travelling at around 3 miles per hour. The substitution of these squat orange automatons in place of dashing human workers makes a colossal difference to Amazon's bottom line. It's been estimated that Amazon's warehouses can now hold 50% more stock and retrieve that stock three times faster. This reduces the overall cost of fulfillment by some 40%. You will see Gmail on the floor, QR products are more affordable planted. for the end uh, the users. Door, and crucially, products they read that are much more likely for to be the van driving and down the street pick. the following day. Amazon isn't about to stop there. In a move that could be described as either ruthless or inspired, upon purchasing Kiva, the Jeff floor, Bezos the changed the dots. name of the company to Amazon codes. Robotics and told all previous Kiva Two customers, household names like Gap, Walgreens and Staples, they'd no longer be allowed to buy new Kiva technology. 
This, of course, gives Amazon an incalculable competitive advantage. Since rolling out the Kiva robot across its fulfillment centers, by 2018 they had 100,000 of them, by now that figure has comfortably surpassed 200,000, Amazon Robotics has been refining the design still further. The new iteration of Kiva, known as Pegasus, is 10 centimeters shorter, meaning more can be stocked on top and uses half the parts, so it's cheaper to manufacture and maintain. Amazon says Pegasus can lift a hefty 600 kilograms and can be customized with a conveyor belt to work in the sortation centers, where, Amazon reports, errors in delivery have been halved thanks to Pegasus. Naturally, Amazon isn't quitting there. Last summer, it announced a newer, thinner robot still called Xanthus and coming to a fulfillment center near you. So how do these pimped out Roombas get around without knocking into each other all the time? Cloud-based software, operating what can fairly be described as an AI-run air traffic control network, coordinates the route of every single robot. Cloud-based this is information all about optimization. Supports What's the quickest route to get to a product that won't interfere with other robots on their own runs? What's the optimum speed, acceleration, and deceleration? As many as 800 robots can be deployed at any one time on the warehouse floor, although in practice, the numbers tend to be kept lower to avoid traffic jams. When their batteries run low, the robots are instructed to find the nearest charging station. Since robots took over the warehouses, changes have been implemented to improve their working conditions. Skylights, for instance, are now covered up, so the robot's sensors aren't confused by glare. Air conditioning units that blow downwards in areas where humans work now blow sideways so as not to topple delicate items from the tops of moving shelves. To navigate, a camera on the robot's undercarriage reads QR codes embedded in the floor, the and individual codes. sensors help the robot slow or swerve to avoid obstacles in their paths. Compared with these scurrying warehouse servants, some other robots working at Amazon look almost humdrum and conventional. The so-called robo stow robotic arm, for instance, yes, wouldn't look out of place yes, in an old-school yes, car factory, robots are... except it can lift a hefty 1,200 kilograms and manipulate shipping pallets to within a tenth of a millimeter accuracy. There's also the labeling robots, nicknamed slam machines by human co-workers for their relentlessly percussive racket. These can label up to one package every second. And for a hint of what will happen in the coming years, Amazon recently purchased Canvas Technologies, a firm specializing in autonomous robotic carts. Just picture the most sci-fi drinks trolley you can imagine. Robots, of course, are only part of the story inside Amazon's smart warehouses. Even the company's most fervent futurists admit the notion of complete automation is a decade away, and even then probably won't happen. So what of the human side? Amazon's management techniques, in concert with all that automation, have made the business astonishingly lean and mean by historic standards. In 2016, it was estimated that by bringing everything in-house, as opposed to all the duplication inherent in a standard high street or shopping mall, Amazon requires only half the employees a traditional retailer might, per $10 million in sales. What are all these humans, hundreds of thousands across the world, actually doing then? Well, since Kiva and its robotic heirs took over, there's much less rushing around than there used to be but there's still plenty of tasks requiring dexterity and problem solving. The two most common roles still done by humans are stowing and picking. When goods arrive at the fulfillment centers, they're stowed by humans onto shelves or pods to be collected later by the robots. The pickers then pick the specific item from the shelves when the robots come by, then send it on to be packed. Workers on the picking side are encouraged to work fast in order to maintain their so-called rate. If workers' rate falls below expectations, employees can be disciplined and ultimately sacked. According to one ex-employee, this rate can be challenging to fulfill. 120 items per hour when they started at the company, rising as high as 280 items per hour just three years later. Errors are also punished. According to the same ex-employee, workers were once permitted one error per 1,000 items, but now they're only allowed one per 2,200. The rates only get more challenging during Prime Day when sales on Amazon skyrocket. One way Amazon encourages workers to make rates is through gamification, or making the whole thing into a game. So instead of a plain old-fashioned graph telling workers where their productivity stands in relation to the rate, workers instead play and compete on in-house games with names like Picks in Space, Mission Racer, or Castle Crafter. So essentially, the faster, and more accurately, employees pick stock, the faster their little pixelated car moves around the track. Other incentive schemes, such as in-house currency swag bucks, reward hard work with Amazon-branded merch such as water bottles or t-shirts. Amazon has regularly found itself in the firing line for its intense working practices. According to reports, as many as 14,000 serious injuries occurred at Amazon sites in 2019, a per-employee rate of nearly double the industry standard. Deaths are infrequent, but not unheard of. In the UK alone, during the three years to 2018, ambulances were called to Amazon warehouses 600 times. 
For its part, Amazon is keen to stress it invests tens of millions of dollars into worker safety awareness programs. But there's no denying injuries spike around Prime Day. So are Amazon's ultra-efficient warehouses ultimately a force for good? While COVID-19 laid waste to vast swathes of the conventional retail landscape, this year Amazon has been processing up to 40% more orders than expected. In the month leading up to March 23rd alone, toilet paper sales increased 186%, sales of cough medicine skyrocketed 862%, and children's vitamins went up 287%. Plainly, in a world where going to the shops can be a risky business, Amazon is fulfilling a need, and as such, ever greater numbers of people are relying on it. Will the robots steal our jobs then? The outlook is unclear, but within Amazon, it's plain to see that humans are still needed for many aspects of the world. And even if robots can one day stow or pick as fast as humans, dealing with mini crises like leaking paint pots on a fast-moving conveyor belt or identifying ripe bananas on site will still need the human touch for some time to come. Whatever the future brings, Amazon's new $40 million robotics lab just outside Boston, for instance, or its tantalizing patent for airship-like floating fulfillment centers, one thing can be guaranteed. As long as we're all buying, Amazon will keep on delivering. Mm -hmm. Prime Minister. These robots are reshaping the industry today. The future of warehousing is going to be like this. AI, super AI will be used in future and create better warehouses. It's beautiful. It's a symphony of humans and machines in the warehouse. Squid robot. They can go anywhere in the warehouse. Maximum payload is 5 kilos for these robots. For higher payloads, they use this automatic forklift that can carry more than one ton. So thank you gentlemen and ladies for your patient hearing. I hope you have some takeaways from this session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, sir, for extending your valuable insights you, to us. As we are at the end of the session, I call upon Mr. Vidya Sagar of 3rd Bcom C to deliver the word of thanks. By the grace of the Almighty, we believe that only by the mutual understanding and support extended by the teachers and equally by all the students, anything and everything is successfully possible. On behalf of all the faculties, management, students, I, P. Vidya Sagar, stand here before you all with much excitement and enthusiasm to render our heartfelt gratitude. A special thanks to our esteemed chief guest, Mr. A. Matthews, for accepting our invitation and for being here with us today. Your thoughts have truly inspired us, sir. Your life history, experiences and current trends that you have shared with us today will surely bound to stamp out our lackadaisical hearts. We are blessed to lend our ears to you, sir, for letting your words permeate our hearts, those who admire you today. As we all believe that every day is a new learning for everyone, from everyone. Never can I forget to mention my gratitude towards our college principal, Dr. P. Wilson, Berzer, Mr. Cyrus, Head of the Department, Dr. Nirmala Mohan, Conference Convener, Dr. Shirley, management, teaching and non-teaching staff who have always been supportive on all our initiatives and encourage us to strive hard for excellence. Thank you, sir, and everyone once again. Till we meet up for a show as this shortly. Until then, all of you take care. Have a splendid day. Dear students, kindly remain in the hall. This, the next session will be beginning shortly. Students, I request you all to raise up and to applaud to welcome our chief guest, Mr. Siva Subramanian, on stage. Students, please applaud to welcome our chief guest on stage. Please sit down, please sit down. The facilitation to study abroad is not limited to STEM education, but various specialization, including research and doctoral studies in multiple domains. High level of services are provided in guiding students in their preparation of research proposals towards securing admission with reputed universities across the globe. Students are also motivated to prepare themselves in succeeding with fully funded masters and doctoral programs abroad. In addition to facilitate on various streams, Center is also extending guidance to students aspiring to study MBBS and MD abroad at reputed universities in Australia, New Zealand, UK, USA, Canada, Ireland and Malaysia. For every level of education, the facilitation is provided from identifying appropriate course matching with student profile, interest, aptitude, right country choices and up to obtain visa. Center also provides support services in booking students accommodation in abroad well in advance at reasonable costs. Team is also periodically monitoring progress of students studying abroad. Center is not limiting its services just on overseas education consultancy alone, but also extending its guidance in preparing for required English proficiency tests like IELTS and TOEFL and aptitude tests like 
GRE, GMAT, etc. For more details and free counseling, contact the Ashwin Center for Learning and Overseas Education Private Limited at 1947 G Block, Annalaga, Chennai 40. What you have learned is just a drop in the ocean. What is to be learned is the ocean itself. Good afternoon gentlemen and gentlewomen of Madras Christian College. I am Akhilesh Kumar RM from 3rd BCom C. I am honored to be your MC for the session 3 titled Exploring Business Ideas for the Future. On behalf of Department of Commerce, Self Finance Stream, I extend a warm welcome to our distinguished guest, to our faculty members and all the talented students gathered here. So without further delay, let us welcome Mr. Shahul Amid from 3rd BCom B to deliver the welcome address. Good evening to one and all present here. It is with great pleasure and enthusiasm that I extend a warm welcome to all of you present today. As we gather to honor a distinguished guest in our midst, we are delighted to have Mr. Shiva Subramaniam, the co-founder of Biomimicry Compass, joining with us for the third session of the conference. Mr. Shiva Subramaniam is the co-founder of Biomimicry Compass, an IIT Madras incubated company that enables innovation using nature's strategies and principles. Biomimicry is the practice of learning from nature to address human challenges. Biomimicry Compass develops nature-based solutions to replace current unsustainable products, processes, and services. As a spokesperson for nature, Mr. Shiva Subramaniam uses biomimicry to enable students and young leaders to learn from 3.8 billion years of nature's wisdom and develop an interdisciplinary perspective on problem solving, STEM, and sustainability. Mr. Shiva Subramaniam started his career as an advocate at Madras University at the Madras University, Madras High Court, specializing in constitutional law, transportation law, and matrimonial law. Mr. Shiva Subramaniam is a guest faculty at Indian Institute of Technology, Madras, where he teaches courses on creativity, entrepreneurship, life skill, cross-culture, and biomimicry. He was the chief innovation officer for the Gopalakrishnan Desh Pandey Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. IIT Madras, enabling label to market transformation of early stage ventures in universities across India. I would like to express our, my gratitude to Mr. Shiva Subramaniam for taking the time to be here with us today. Thank you, sir, for uh, coming today. Your presence is truly a privilege, and we eagerly anticipate the wisdom and inspiration you will impart during your address. On behalf of the Commerce Department Self Finance Stream, I would like to ex welcome the delegate staffs head of the department and students for the conference. Thank you. Thank you, Shahul. Now, Dr. Zenith Zarina, ma'am, will honor our chief guest with a memento and a fruit basket. Nature has the simplest solutions to the most complex problems of life. Nature has an answer to every single problem we face. This is what, sir, being a biomimic strongly believes. We are looking forward to hear and learn a lot more from you, sir. The stage, the stage is yours, sir. Uh, hi, good evening. Can you hear me? Um, yeah, okay. Uh, can you hear me in front? Can you hear me at the back? Yes, just raise your hand if you can hear me at the back. All right. So I know uh, the time is 3.25, and I should finish by 4 o'clock. Is that okay? Ah, good. Uh, you are all happy I'm seeing, right? Right, so um, I don't. What what do you, what do you want to hear from me? Give me one or two suggestions. Give me something that you want to hear from me. 
What do you want to hear from me? I'm sorry? I need, I need, I need your answer. What do you want to hear from me? What would you like to learn? What would you like to learn? Go ahead. Yes. What would you like to learn? What? You have 20 in, in 35 minutes. What would you like to learn? I need answers. I, unless you tell me, I can't speak. What would you like to learn? One of you. One of you. What happened? What would you like to learn? One, just tell me what would you like to learn. You, yes. I'm waiting. I'm, I'm not going to speak unless you tell me what you want to learn. You have to tell me what you want to learn. All of you are in first year, second year, third year, final year, BCom, MCom. What is the one thing that you want to learn? One thing. Yes. Come this side. I can't hear you. He wants to learn. Thank you. He wants to learn some business ideas for the future. Okay, let me start. Can I can I have your attention, please? Excuse me. Can I have your attention? Okay, uh, can I have can I have some silence in the room, please? Okay, I I'm just going to speak to you for some time, but I need silence because if you're not silent, I won't be able to speak, right? And Let's try and find out what is it that we can, we can do in the next 25, 30 minutes. Like I was introduced, my name is Shiva. And I'm not Shiva Subramaniam, it's a very long name. My name is Shiva. And right now, at this moment in time, I teach, I teach at IIT Madras. I teach design thinking and biomimicry. Let me give you a little, little snapshot of my life. My first job. Because when I spoke to Shirley, she said, you know, can you share with the students something about your own life? So I said, okay. So my first, I'm, so I'm going to do three things. Let me introduce myself, number one. Number two, let me tell you something from what he asked, what you could do in the future as peep, as, as. Can I have your silence, please? Seriously, because... I, I need to I need to really think and speak and all that. It's very difficult to to stand on stage and speak, right? So second thing, I'm going to talk to you about something that we can that all of you can look for in the future, especially to be on your own. And finally, any questions that you may have. Okay, question number the the, the first part about my life. I started my life in the Taj Coromandel. I was a I was a receptionist in the Taj. Taj is the five star hotel. In, in Madras, and most of, the, most of the things I learned in my life, I learned in the Taj. I was about 19, 20, your age, little, maybe older to you, I don't know. So my job was to stand, I was standing behind the counter. My job was to go to the hotel at 9 o'clock in the night and come back at 7 o'clock in the morning. Every day, 9 o'clock in the night, 7 o'clock in the morning. 9 o'clock in the night, 7 o'clock in the morning. Every day. And... It's, it's, it's one of the best things in the world. You know, something that I, I learned in the Taj. I learned in the Taj, of course, I learned not to sleep at night, which is very difficult. I also learned to smile at people. I learned to shake hands. I learned to say hello. I learned to say good evening. I learned to be pleasant. I learned to constantly smile when people are angry with you. Big lessons. Now, why did I go to the Taj? Why did I go to work in a hotel? Why? I have to confess. I have to confess. I went to work in the hotel because I was doing my BCom. I was doing my BCom like any of you. Uh, 1977, I was doing my BCom and I failed in my BCom. I failed in cost accounts. 
special accounts, and, and banking. I was really upset with myself. And when, when Shirley said, when, 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 when Shirley said, come and speak to you, I said, I'm not the right person to speak to you because all of you are commerce graduates and I have failed in my BCom. So I failed the first time. I got 18, 19, and 20 in special accounts, cost accounts, and banking. I wrote my exam again. I failed again. I got 21, 22, 23. I wrote my exam again, and this time I passed. I got 35, 36, 37. Why am I telling you this story? Why am I telling young graduates, young commerce graduates that I failed? I'm only saying this story because I had no business to fail. I had no business to fail. I should not have failed. You know, when I failed in the BCom, I was constantly blaming other people, blaming my teachers, blaming my life, blaming people. Now I realize, now I realize when I'm teaching at IIT that I had no business to fail in my BCom. Because BCom is easy to pass. There are more difficult things in life. So the big lesson I want to pass on to you, the big lesson I want to pass on to you is the next three years, you have nothing else to do. You shouldn't be doing anything else except concentrating on your studies. That's all. Take a lesson from me. Take a lesson from me. Because it's very difficult, very difficult to come back to life. Very difficult. Because in BCom, I was studying in Jain College, AM Jain College. I was a good student, but I was not paying attention in class. I was, during the exams, I was interested in literature, so I was reading Shakespeare and all those things. I was not really interested in my subjects. But I should not have done that. I should, why is it, why is it that I am, that I am talking to 700, 800 young people and telling you in front of you without any shame that I fail? Because failure is not a problem. I'm not ashamed of failing. I'm only requesting that each one of you, for the next two years, do nothing else except studying your subjects. Nothing else. There is no need to. So once you finish, once you finish, for me, for instance, once I finished my BCom, I left the Taj and I joined Law College Madras. Law College Madras is a three-year program, and I finished my law and I became a lawyer. I was practicing as a lawyer for about 10 years. I was practicing constitutional law and matrimonial law. And then I finished as a lawyer. I joined TCS, Tata Consultancy Services. I was working there for about 20 years. Now, for the last 10 years, I teach at IIT Madras. So I'm telling you the story of my life just to help you understand that every portion of your life is important. Right now, at this point in time, when you are 19 and 20 and first year and second year and third year, the only job you have, the only work you have is to finish being successful. Finish it. Just finish it. Nothing else. Pay attention in class because that's why classes are for. When the teacher is teaching you, pay attention, take notes, and that's all you need. That's all you need to pass your exams. Nothing more. And then start putting your ambition. Say, okay, I'm going to finish my BCom. I want to do my business. I want to do my MCom. I want to do, I want to work in an office. That's it. So that lesson number one. Lesson number one, finish what you start. Finish it successfully. Lesson number one. You've all started a journey in your life. You have told yourself, I'm going to join the BCom course. Finish it. Get it done with. Everything else is later on. So what happens after you finish? What happens? Anyone? You are now 21. You have finished your BCom. You have finished your MCom. What next? I want answers. What next? What would you like to do next? Give me. Yes. What would you like to do next? Yes. What are you doing? What, what are you doing? Which year are you in? Second year. So 
After you finish, what would you like to do? I'm sorry? Tanya says that she'll finish her BCom and she wants to, she's doing some professional course side by side and she wants to start, you know, start working somewhere, right? That's what you're doing. So one of you may want to do business. Who? Who wants to do business? Who wants to do a business? Who wants to be an entrepreneur in this class? Who? Anyone? Very good. Anyone who wants to, uh, wants to uh, do MCom? MCom? Anyone? Anyone is doing MCom now? Anyone is doing MCOM? No one? Okay. Anyone wants to do PhD? 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 No one? All right. So, excuse me, can I have your attention, please? Can I have your attention? So, I, I have, can I have your attention, please? I need some silence. Yeah. Okay, so I have these slides, okay? I'm going to, I'm going to start putting on these slides. Now, there's one slide, that's one slide I want you to look at. I want you to look at. So, because I don't have time, I'm not going to explain all the slides. Can I have, uh, how do I move the, I can't see what is there. I can't see. Yeah, this is, okay, excuse me. Now, that slide you see in front of you, that slide you see in front of you, it's called the United Nations. United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Look at that. There are 17 goals. How many goals? 17. Now, each of those goals, how do I see my own slides? I can't see my own slides. Now, there are 17 goals. What is goal number one? Anyone? Very good. Goal number two? Goal number three? You can't read. Oh, what happened? Okay, uh, I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop this at 3.45. And I want questions from you, okay? I want questions from you so I can answer. So you better keep your questions ready. And then we'll stop at 4 o'clock. You can ask me any question you want. You can ask me about my BCom, about my law, whatever you want. Right? So start preparing your questions. No. So previous one. Previous. Previous. Hmm. This is what you're seeing. Okay, so this is called, I don't know how many of you have seen this. So whether you're going to be in office, whether you're going to work, whether you're going to study, these are the goals you must watch out for, right? There are 17 goals, 17 goals that every one of us, every one of us must work towards, otherwise the world is going to come to an end. Look at the goals. No poverty. How many of you like to work on no poverty? How many of you? I need answers. I need hands. How, how many of you would like to see a world without poverty? Very good. How many of you want to work on zero hunger? No hunger. Brilliant. How many of you want to work on good health and well-being? You know, it's such an important thing. I'll tell you a small story about my sister. Yeah, my sister. My sister, I, 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 if you can give me some silence, please. You know, it's... I'm not saying you should not talk. I'm only saying that there's a lot of noise here. I'm not able to speak. So my sister was, was diagnosed with kidney disease. She was a diabetic. And once she had, her kidneys failed. And she had to go for dialysis twice a week. I'm sure you've heard of dialysis. Dialysis is you sit down, you, you, you are, you're lying down for five hours. There is a machine. Your kidneys cannot purify your blood, so the machine is purifying your blood. So you lie down for five hours. In front of you, 
from your hand, the, the old blood is taken, it gets into the machine, the machine cleans the blood and puts it back in your body. It takes five hours, three times a week. Now, every day, every week, three times, she has to go to the hospital, get dialysis, come back. Monday, dialysis, Wednesday, dialysis, Friday, dialysis, Saturday, Sunday at home, Monday, dialysis, Wednesday, dialysis, Friday, dialysis. Very difficult, very difficult. And my sister used to call me and saying, Shiva, relief could she said. Because she was not she was not very rich. So a lot of money, lot of problems. And I was really sometimes wishing why is she even alive? Because what is the use? You know, five years, six years of her life every day, up and down, up and down, up and down. And finally last year, unfortunately, she passed away. But now the question for you all of you, the question for all of you is, how can you help? How can you help? You can be doing your BCOM, so what? You can still help in good health and well-being. How can you bring down the cost of the dialysis? Each dialysis costs 2,500 rupees for one session. As commerce students, as commerce students, think about how you can bring down the cost from 2,500 to 500 rupees. Think about how you can market, how you can market an NGO. Right? Start an NGO, when 20 of you get together, buy 20 dialysis machines, and can you people use your commerce knowledge, use your commerce knowledge for good health and well-being. Look at the scope of what you are learning. If I'm going to speak to, at IIT Madras to my students, I tell them to make a better dialysis machine. I tell them as engineers, as engineers, they must make a dialysis machine for which you don't have to go to the hospital, where the blood can be cleaned in your house itself. And many of my students are doing that. But as commerce students, as commerce students, how would you make good health and well-being possible? Right? Speak to your teachers. Speak to your teachers and ask them, I want to be a business person. I want to bring down the cost of dialysis machines. Right? Second, look at the second one, third, fourth one, quality education. All of you are sitting down here, air conditioned hall, speaker, teachers. You know how many children in, 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 in India cannot go to school? How easy it is, right? How easy it is to give them, give one mobile phone to 20 children and teach. Many of you can do that. Look at the next one, gender equality. For me, it's my favorite topic, favorite topic. One of, the, one of my students in IIT Madras is, is making a, okay, I, I'll save it, I'll save it for the next one. So, this is gone, how do I get it back? Thank you. So, so these are the goals. I don't have the time. I don't have the time to describe all the goals to you, but I'll send it to you. Look at the goals and find out what you like and start going after the goals, right? Look at the goals, gender equality, clean water and sanitation, affordable energy, decent work, industry, reduced inequalities. Look at, look at, good, look at goal number 12. Look at goal number 12. What is goal number 12? That happens to all of us, right? Every day, every day, morning to evening, we waste food. You know, at IIT Madras, we measure the amount of food wasted every day. You know how much food is wasted? You're not going to believe me. We have a weighing machine. So once the food is eaten, the, the students put the, put the food into a waste paper bin, waste paper bin, all the students. So there's a weighing machine and, uh, and the weighing machine keeps weighing the waste food. So one kilo, two kilos, three kilos, four kilos, five kilos, six kilos, 
every day 1200 kilos of food is wasted every day what are you going to do about it as commerce students where is the opportunity you know that food waste can be reused how are you going to help the world with your knowledge of commerce think about it so number 12 is common to all of us right so now i'm going to talk to you about how do i do the next one so this is what i teach this is something i don't have the time for but this is how do you look at nature and understand how nature solves problems and use that so what happened um, so this is biomimicry i'm going to skip it now i'm going to skip it now maybe some other time but this is what i teach essentially biomimicry is looking at nature understanding how nature solves the problem and using that to solve the problem for instance here you have the lotus on paint now the lotus leaf the lotus leaf never gets dirty that means the lotus leaf is an engineer how does the lotus leaf remain clean when the water falls on the lotus leaf the water is washed away and how does how does it do that there are small micro micro modules on the lotus leaf when the water falls the water is washed away the lotus leaf is clean now how do you solve a human problem my clothes get dirty your clothes get dirty can you use the lotus leaf technology to keep your clothes clean that is biomimicry so that company lotusan paint makes paint using the same technology so when you paint your house with that your house remains clean so i'm not going to talk about it now because it's a long topic i just thought because you know i wanted to introduce the topic to you so you start googling biomimicry finding out what it means and all that but i'm more interested in the next slide this is what it is so every one of you as commerce students needs to learn this slide and then i'll stop every one of you here every one of you here must understand that anyone anyone who buys anything buys something because there is a need so now you have to understand that if you want to do business if you want to do anything at all in life you must understand that every one of us does it because there is a need now supposing i supposing i want a cell phone and you are selling a cell phone right what do i need what do i need i want a cell phone what do i need you need the money sir cell phone i need a cell phone and you have a cell phone to sell okay sir so how i will give you 10000 rupees and take a cell phone from you why because, because you need a cell phone i need a cell phone right every one of you did you go to the canteen this afternoon yes why did you go there because there was a need to eat you took out the money and gave it to him so now now try and understand this is a big secret okay now there are three needs what are the three needs functional need social needs so of functional need means like you know toothpaste you need to brush your teeth right you need to brush your teeth therefore you will pay money and get toothpaste the second need is social need you want to look nice right you want to wear jewelry you want to wear ties you want to wear a watch you want to have a cell phone so social need is you you spend money for social need and finally people spend money for emotional need for instance if you are a, if you are a, if if you are if you don't go home if you don't go home till 8 o'clock your parents are going to call you hey enga pa irukke enna pachana achu why because they have an emotional need to connect with you then what will you say appa enakku or cell phone vaangi kudutre so that na vandu enga irundhalum ungalku phone pannuven and they buy you a cell phone they they take a loan and buy you a cell phone why because they have an emotional need to know where their child is correct all of us have emotional needs and most of us will pay money for emotional needs now as commerce students as commerce students ask yourself where you can make money where you can make a business using these needs look at this college right this college is born out of what need this college mcc is born out of what needs what are the needs functional need it gives you education then 
social need kalya what is social need you are studying in a good college right excellent college i'm sorry can't hear reputation reputation very good emotional need in it what is emotional need for mcc emotional need in it what is the emotional need that mcc is fulfilling what is the emotional need that mcc is fulfilling yeah go ahead tell me what is the emotional need so uh, functional need you get your degree social need reputation emotional need your parents are happy that you are becoming a graduate correct otherwise they'll be very upset right suppose you're not going to be a graduate my, my when i failed in my bcom my parents were very upset they were crying my father and mother were crying because i was not even a graduate now you all your parents are happy that their children are be are becoming graduates so these are the three needs i'm going to stop now i'm going to ask for questions so finally finally this slide two things i want to leave you with two things whatever you do in your life whatever you do in your life become independent please two there are two types of independence one is financial independence don't depend on anyone for money no don't depend on anyone for money and what is the other independence what is the other independence financial independence and and what emotional independence right be your own person be a person who can stand on your own feet and don't worry if you get into trouble never tell yourself i am an emotionally independent person i am a financially independent person i don't want to talk about the next one because it's going to take all day long i'm going to stop now i'm going to stop now what did i what did i say in the last 20 minutes i talked to you about my life i spoke to you about the united nations sustainable development goals because you can each one of you here can use your commerce use your subjects to look at each one of those goals to find out what you want to do i spoke about why you will get money if you go to an organization if you go to business what are the three needs that you can talk about which is the emotional need functional need and social need and finally i'm saying that every one of us every one of us should try and attain financial and emotional independence and being an entrepreneur being on your own being on your own not having to work for anyone at all gives you that independence so I, i'm going to stop now and i'm going to ask for at least one or two questions go ahead please yes i need a question i need two three questions otherwise we just sit here and stare at each other's face come on be brave enough stand up and ask a question yes ask a question don't see don't be frightened of asking questions because if you if you, if you you'll never get the answers otherwise i i i really want to go back with a good memory saying madras christian college great questions so do a service to your college now the teachers can ask me questions too what is this he is pawn wonder the color vada 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 you are saying what is this just give him a chance ha ah, there is one one question there sir thank you for first of all i wanted to thank you for the wonderful delivery of knowledge sir so i wanted to know you have been in taj then you have transferred to tcs for a decade you have worked there and what made you to enter into this biomimicry all these researches you have made uh, 
how you ended up here i wanted to know what is the question how you ended up in this research that biomimicry in iit madras after a decade for the working yeah. in taj okay so good question thank you and that's what is going to happen to all of you every one of us going to happen see life no life is some 80 years maximum 80 years okay now these 80 years 80 years most of the time we don't have a choice we don't have a choice of exactly what's going to happen none of us have a choice so whatever you do whatever you do whether you do bcom whether you do business whether you do a law whether you do uh, teach anything you do at all you must understand that you'll be upset for some time you'll be upset for about 2 or 3 months and then whatever you're doing you should just tell yourself till the next job i'm going to enjoy myself i'm not going to be too stressful saying ayo now in the lawyer i reclame i you know for means when i was a lawyer i wanted to be a supreme court judge big dreams okay five of my friends are judges in the supreme court actually i have a story for you can i tell you a story yes or no okay so i was teaching french i was teaching french in a school so every day i used to go at that time i was also practicing as a lawyer my my class my french class starts at 9 o'clock in the morning 10:30 were ko french class so angend i used to go to the court so i know the know the school when it was in pudupet you understand tamil no yeah so my school was in pudupet so i take my scooter and i take my lawyers you have you see the lawyers court right black color court i take the lawyers court and i go and teach french angend 10:30 i from the school i go to the court and it was going on then i stopped teaching i went off doing something else and all that one day i got a call about 10 15 years ago i got a call uh, and i said um, hello and sh- this lady she said um, sir now and i want to talk to you i said i am your student from french student i said okay very good illa uh, i want to tell you that i have become a lawyer i said oh great super wonderful you become a lawyer she says no you only help me become a lawyer i said i never helped you to become a lawyer she says no no every day when you used to come to the school with the court and all that i told myself one day i'll become a lawyer and she became a lawyer 5 years ago 5 years ago she called me again and said hello sir i said hello then she said i have some good news for you i was thinking good news means you know marriage something like that she said uh, i said yes what's the news she said sir i have become a judge of the madras high court and she's a judge now i don't want to tell her name because she may be upset but right now even yesterday she decided a very important case and she's now a judge of the madras high court so what is the moral of the story what is the moral of the story anyone any one of you any one of you can be anything you want and at the same time remember every one of you every one of you excuse me can i have some silence please you must remember every one of you is now a role model to someone else when you go to college when you go to college in the morning there is a small child looking at you there is a small child on the road who cannot afford to go to school looking at you and saying one day i will also go to college like her every time every time you you do something good for someone there's a small child looking at you and saying one day i want to be like that man you don't know you don't know who you are inspiring you don't know but every one of you every one of you in this room is inspiring somebody you are inspiring your parents every time you get up in the morning and say amma na college pore your mother is happy saying enakku enakku nadakadathu and you know kuandey nadakkaradhu you know because you are inspiring your father and your mother otherwise how do you think parents can earn money and give you the fees so do not forget 
that every one of you in this world is inspiring somebody else. All right, one more question and we stop. Last question, yes. Sir, what is your greatest fear till now, sir? I'm sorry? What is your greatest fear? My greatest fear? Yes, sir. He's, <laughs> I, I, okay, I, I don't have, uh, how do I answer that question? I'll tell you, I, I'm, not, I'm not going to answer the question, but I'm telling you about four fears. Good question. There are four fears all of us have. Four fears. The fear number one is the fear of death. Everyone. Everyone is afraid of dying. Yesterday, I got a call from my schoolmate, schoolmate, that his son had died, 37 years old. I was crying on the phone. He was also crying. I was also crying. So everybody is afraid of death, everyone. So fear number one, death. But we can't do anything about it because we know that all of us will die. Fear number two, anyone fear number two? Fear of loneliness, that I will be alone. I'll have no friends at all, which is why we do Facebook, LinkedIn, houses, families, we get married because we don't want to be lonely. We want to be with people all the time. Third fear, third fear is, anyone? Third fear? Don't say dogs. Third fear. Third fear. Fear of freedom. You don't want to be free. If I told you now, you're free to do whatever you want. You'll say, went up, went up, went up. Right? This whole college, this infrastructure restricts your freedom. And what is the fourth fear? Four fears. Fourth fear? It's called the fear of meaninglessness. We want our life to be something. The question is, why am I born? What will happen if I don't, if I'm not alive? So fear of being meaningful, doing something in my life, doing something in my life which means something for somebody. That's it. So these are the four fears. Which fear do you have? Anyone? Which fear? What about you? Huh? Fear of loneliness, fear of death, fear of uh, freedom, and fear of meaninglessness. Fear of meaninglessness. Fear of? Meaninglessness, sir. All right. So, so, that, so, so it's a common thing. All of us will have it, but doesn't matter. It's okay to have fears. All right. I have to stop now because Shirley told me to stop at 4 o'clock, right? So, thank you very much. I, I, wish, I wish I could teach you a lot of stuff, maybe someday. If you, if you come to IIT Madras, please let me know. It would be nice to take you around campus, you know, introduce you to, to my students and find out if we can do something because engineers engineers and commerce students are a fantastic combination right engineers excuse me excuse me please engineers make things engineers make things and commerce people market things sell things so if if an engineer makes a uh, If an engineer makes a phone, it is the commerce person who knows how to sell the phone. You fix the price. You find out how much it will cost. You find out the market. So engineers and commerce students must work together. And that's the scope. So don't think it's a different field altogether. And try and make friends. I don't know whether MCC has that, has that facility, but try and make friends with other colleges so that you understand what they are doing and become you know, friends with each other, collaborate, and all that. So thank you once again. Thank you for enlightening us with your words of wisdom, sir. As we near this end of this event, it is essential to express our gratitude to our chief guest to, and to all those who made this event possible. Quoting Thiruvalluvar's famous Kural, 
நன்றி மறப்பது நன்றன்று நன்றல்லது அன்றே மறப்பது நன்று ஐ வெல்கம் மிஸ்டர் ஜோஷ்வா ஸ்டேவர்ட் டி ஃப்ரம் தேர்ட் பி காம் ஏ டு டெலிவர் தி ஓட் ஆஃப் தேங்க்ஸ் ஆன் பிஹாஃப் ஆஃப் ஆல் ஆஃப் அஸ் A thankful heart is a parent of virtue and a grateful heart is a mother of miracles. On behalf of our department, I would like to share my sincere gratitude to the prestigious speaker and a resourceful scholar, Mr. Shiva Subramaniam, a man who devoted his life for the nature's wisdom. Once again, thank you, sir, especially for enlightening our students with the fire of innovation. Your specialized speech made our session an energetic ending for the day. So I would like to th- give my sincere thanks to our principal sir, Mr. Pree Wilson, Basar, Mr. Cyrus Kalluprakal and the head of our department, Dr. Nirmala Mohan and our staff advisor, Dr. M. Menaka and the conference convenient, Dr. Shirley Devakirubai uh, and every staff and volunteers who worked for our event for this resounding success of the conference. So and here I am once again, thank you for everyone present here. for this making this event a remarkable success thank you all so all of you here please kindly stay here for a moment i request everyone to please be seated till the chief guest leaves I request all the I request everyone to please be seated. I request the forum reps to go to the refreshments uh, place immediately. I request all the forum reps to go to the refresh refreshment stalls immediately.